Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Today we're going to look at a certain generalization of prime numbers. And we'll start just by recalling the notion of prime numbers inside the natural numbers. And so let's do that with the following definition. So we say that P, which is a natural number, is prime if P is not equal to 1 and its only divisors are 1 and P. Now we've got this little fact which is fairly easy to prove, although we won't prove it here, and that's if P divides A times B, then that means P divides A or P divides B. And this is an immediate result of the primeness of P. And so I'd like to start this video off by looking at the question of when primes are not primes in number systems that are different than the integers or different than the natural numbers. And so in other words, we'll look at extensions of the integers where primes inside the integers are not primes in these extensions. And then we'll finish the, something off by looking at a place where there really is not as good of a notion of primes. Okay, so let's get started. And we'll get started with something known as the Gaussian integers. So the Gaussian integers denoted by Z adjoin I are all combinations of A plus BI where A and B are integers. So you can really think about them as lattice points in the complex plane if you'd like. And now let's list some numbers that are most definitely prime within the natural numbers. So two is prime, the number five is prime, the number 13 is prime, the number 17 is prime, and the number 29 is prime within the natural numbers. But I'm zeroing in on these five numbers. Well, actually this extends infinitely, but these are the first five such examples because while these are prime within the natural numbers, they are not prime within the so-called Gaussian integers. And that's because we can factor these over the Gaussian integers using a trick involving complex conjugates. So let's notice that two can in fact be written as one plus i times one minus i. And that's because this is like a difference of squares that will multiply out to one squared minus i squared. But that's gonna be one plus one, which is two. So again, not prime within the Gaussian integers. Now let's look at five. This can be written as two plus i times two minus i. You might notice that it could also be written as 1 plus 2i and 1 minus 2i, but we're going to stick with this way of writing it. <clears throat> but the important thing here is that this is not prime in the Gaussian integers. We've just factored the number 5. And now we can keep going. 13 is the same thing as 3 plus 2i times 3 minus 2i. That's because 9 plus 4 is 13. Again, 13 is not prime in this Gaussian integer world. Now, like I said, we can keep going. This is the same thing as 4 plus i times 4 minus i. And then 29, for instance, is the same thing as 5 plus 2i times 5 minus 2i. So let's look at all of these. We have two. Well, that's really unique to itself because two is the only even prime. Then we have five, which is one more than four. 13, which is one more than 12. 17, which is one more than 16. 29, which is one more than 28. So let's notice that all of these are congruent to one modulo four. And that motivates the following big fact, which we will not prove. Although that being said, I've proven this on the channel before. You can find it in my playlist about writing natural numbers as sums of squares. So here's my big rule. If we have a prime, P, which is congruent to 1 modulo 4, then that prime can be written as the sum of squares. So, like I said, that's something that we've proven previously on the channel. So that means that there exist A and B, which are natural numbers, such that P is equal to A squared plus B squared. But the beautiful thing about this sum of squares, 
is that we can always factor a sum of squares over Gaussian integers using complex conjugates. This is the same thing as a plus bi and then a minus bi. So here we have this is p. So in other words, primes that are of the form 1 mod 4 are not primes in the Gaussian integers. That being said, primes that are 3 mod 4 are primes in the Gaussian integers. And then you might ask, well, we factored p as a plus bi times a minus bi. What about these component factors? Are those primes within the Gaussian integers? Well, they are, most of the time at least, and we can maybe prove that in an upcoming video if you'd like. So maybe post in the comments if you'd like to see that. Okay, so I'd like to give another example where we have an extension of the integers that does not preserve what I'll call primeness. So let's do that. If you're looking to start your own domain, personal website, or online store, look no further than squarespace.com. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but many, many academic websites are outdated. They look like they were designed in the 1990s or maybe the early 2000s, but not what I consider the early 2000s, which end around 2200, but what most people consider the early 2000s, like before 2005. So I think more academics, especially mathematicians, should think about upping their website game. And how could you do that? Well, I'd say with today's video sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace has tons of templates that offer awesome customization options and no coding required. Although I know you math people out there might know how to code a little bit. And if you'd like to access the code base, you can. You can even do nice and easy LaTeX integration like I have on my, my website. You should go check it out. Whether you're revamping your personal website running an online store, or you've just begun your journey into web design, Squarespace has all of the tools that you need to succeed. So what are you waiting for? Go check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Michael Penn to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And once again, I'd like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so for our next example, we're gonna look at something called the Eisenstein integers. And the Eisenstein integers are written as Z adjoin omega. And this is in fact everything of the form A plus B times omega plus C times omega squared, where A, B, and C are integers. And you might say, well, what is omega? Well, omega is taken to be any primitive third root of unity. That being said, we might as well take it to be e to the i 2 pi over 3. That's maybe the canonical third root or primitive third root of unity. And then if we take omega to be equal to that, we know that omega cubed is equal to 1. In other words, omega cubed minus 1 is equal to 0. But omega is most definitely not 1, and we can factor omega cubed minus 1 as omega minus 1 times omega squared plus omega plus 1. So that means that this stuff that's left over in our factorization is in fact equal to 0. And that's like the defining rule of omega. So we had a defining rule for the imaginary unit that i squared was negative 1. And our defining rule for omega could perhaps be written as omega squared plus omega equals negative 1, if we'd like. So this looks somewhat similar to the Gaussian integers, but we have this little tweak. And like I said, these are called the Eisenstein integers. So let's look at a couple of Eisenstein integers, which are prime within the natural numbers, but they are not prime within Eisenstein integers. And we'll start with the number seven. And let's notice that the number seven can be written as two plus three times omega times two plus three times omega squared. And you know, that requires a little bit more work than it did in the case of the Gaussian integers, but let's multiply this out just to make sure we see what's going on. So this is gonna give us four plus nine, that's two times two is four, three times three is nine, omega times omega squared is omega cubed, which is one. And then we'll have plus, 
six times omega plus omega squared. And that's from like our cross terms. But now let's recall by our yellow box right here, we have omega times omega squared is negative one. So in the end, we get four plus nine, which is 13 minus six, which is most definitely seven. So this all works out. This is an appropriate factorization of the prime number seven over the Eisenstein integers. So let's look at another example. We can in fact take 13 and do the same thing. In this case, it's three plus four times omega times three plus four times omega squared. And I'll let you guys multiply that out to check that in fact, that is a factorization of 13 over Eisenstein integers. Now let's look at this. Notice what's similar about seven and 13? Well, both of these are one mod three. So these are both, like I said, congruent to one modulo three, and that motivates a similar big rule to what we had before. So I won't prove this, but I'll just state it. So the big rule over Eisenstein integers goes like this. If we have a prime, which is one mod three, then that means that we can write the prime in the following form. P is equal to a squared minus ab plus b squared. I think I proved that maybe on the second channel when we looked at quadratic forms evaluated at integers. So primes of the form one mod three can be written as this following quadratic form. But the interesting thing about that following quadratic form is it factors with Eisenstein integers as a plus b omega times a plus b omega squared. So it's no longer a prime within the Eisenstein integers. So now that we've looked at these, I'd like to look at an example where the idea of primeness starts to fall apart. Okay, now for our last example. And for this last example, we're gonna look at the extension of the integers, z adjoined the square root of minus five, or maybe i times the square root of five if you would prefer that. So this is gonna be similarly as to before, all combinations of the number one and the square root of minus five where your coefficients are within integers. So now I'd like to make the following observation. We can most definitely factor six as two times three. That would be the prime factorization of six just over the integers but we can also factor six as one plus the square root of negative five, and then one minus the square root of negative five, because that turns into one plus five, which is equal to six. But what gives here? Over in the natural numbers, we have unique factorization. I haven't written that down here, but that's like a pretty important fact about the primes in the natural numbers is that you get unique factorization. And that actually follows from this fact right here fairly quickly. You know, maybe not super quickly, but there's a little bit of work involved. But here we do not have unique factorization, or it's not totally clear if we have unique factorization or not. We factored six into two times three, and we've also factored six into this one plus root negative five and one minus root negative five. So now what we like to check is that two is prime in this setup, but really we'll just say two can't be factored because it's really clear that this notion of primeness is falling apart here. So two can't be factored. So let's check that, and we'll check that by trying to factor it. We'll take two and write it as a plus b root minus five times c plus d root minus five. And now we'll take the complex modulus of both sides. This is like a standard trick when you're working over these extensions of the natural numbers of the integers here. So like I said, we're gonna take the modulus. That's like the absolute value for complex numbers. Um, actually, we're gonna take the modulus squared, I should say. So that's gonna give us a four over here. Then here we'll have a squared plus five b squared for our first term. For our second term, we'll have c squared plus five d squared. But now since a, b, c, and d are all integers, 
we know that B and D must be equal to zero because if they're not zero, then this right-hand side is most definitely bigger than four. So like I said, this has to be zero and this also has to be zero. And that leaves us with four is equal to A times C quantity squared. But that means that A times C is equal to two. That's because now we're just working over integers here. Maybe we can just take the positive square root if we need to. But what does that mean? That means that for instance, a is equal to two or c is and c is equal to one or vice versa, but we might as well make this choice. But if a is equal to two and c is equal to one, we already know that b and d are zero. That means our factorization that we have achieved is not super interesting. It's just the factorization of two times one. So we've shown that this indeed cannot be factored. So that makes two something like a prime. We'll call it an irreducible. But now, meaning that two is this kind of irreducible, this semi-prime, we know that two divides six, but that also means that two divides this version of six, one plus the square root of minus five, and then one minus the square root of minus five. And now we'll check that our fact over here does not work in this case. So in other words, we'll check that two doesn't divide either of those. But let's maybe point that out. So note what we'll show is that two does not divide one plus root negative five and two does not divide one minus root negative five. But maybe we'll just focus on this first one because the second one is gonna follow fairly similarly. So let's do this pi contradiction. So we'll assume that two does divide that. But if two does divide that, that means we can write one plus root negative five as two times a plus b root negative five. But now we'll just view this in the complex numbers and extract the real part. So if we extract the real part from both sides, we get one equals two times a, which means a equals one half, but that means that one half is an integer. By our assumption, we took a and b both to be integers because we're factoring over the Eisenstein integers. But uh, one half is most definitely not an integer, so that leads us to our contradiction. So that means that this fact over here does not hold in z adjoin root five. So that means we need to fix our terminology over here a little bit. And so I'm gonna change this n to an r, and here we're pointing to kind of the more general theory of a, something called a ring, and we'll say that p in r is an irreducible if p is not equal to one and the only divisors are one and p. So we'll change this rule from prime to irreducible and then we'll change this from a fact to a definition and that definition will be something like this. So if p divides a times b implies that p divides a or p divides b, then we say p is prime. So that patches like our terminology here. So we're using the terminology irreducible for this notion of having a divisor. And then this fact that points towards unique factorization will be the new thing that we are defining to be the notion of a prime. And like I pointed out before, I've got a second channel where I have lecture videos. If you really want to learn a mathematics course from beginning to end, that should be linked on the screen right now. And that's a good place to stop.